Thought Leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Thanks so much for joining us today for the next month in our Tuesday series in which we're bringing in one of our all-star guests to take over the series, picking the topics of the month, and joining me on all the episodes. For the month of May, our takeover guest is Jennifer Spang. Jen's the income tax accounting leader in PwC's national office. This month, she takes over the podcast to share the latest on income tax accounting, including recent global and U.S. tax policy developments, as well as insights on the FASB's income tax disclosure project. Time is ticking. We're at a place where now countries actually need to go implement the rules themselves. So that's really where we're at now. If you are sitting within a company trying to figure out how do I prepare myself for this, it's not a question of what do I focus on one thing or even two things. There are multiple things across multiple jurisdictions, across multiple levels. That was Jen and Pat Brown, the co-leader of PwC's Washington National Tax Services Practice. They joined me for an episode packed with insights and helpful advice for U.S. companies. They start with the OECD's Pillar 2 model rules and related developments around the globe, as well as what this may mean for multinational companies from both an accounting and business perspective. If you haven't been paying attention to these developments, now is definitely the time to start. And spoiler alert, this is not just a topic for uh, people in the income tax area like VPs of tax. They also hit on the Inflation Reduction Act, including speculation as to why certain credits are structured as refundable or transferable, and talk about some other U.S. policy considerations. They've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. So Pat, Jen, welcome to the podcast. Looking forward to our month of May talking about income taxes. And in particular, I think this is an episode I personally was most looking forward to because tax policy, which is what we're going to be talking about today, sort of impacts all companies equally across the board. Well, maybe not equally, but definitely impacts all companies. So something for everyone with this one. And I know one of the things we're going to be talking about just rolls off the tongue, OECD Pillar 2. And we have talked about that before. It just, I think we had almost an entire episode devoted to it. However, since people may not want to go back for that refresher, Jen, I thought maybe you could give at least a quick snippet to bring people sort of up to speed so they can understand what else we're talking about today. Yes, because it is here, as we'll talk about. So um, so Pillar 2 is really about the enactment of a global minimum tax. And there's a few things to keep in mind about that. But essentially, it's a system of top-up taxes, all with the objective of getting all entities, well, that are within the scope to be paying a 15% minimum tax. Now, importantly, that is by jurisdiction. So you're testing it at every entity. um, And it is based on financial statements. So that's a serious departure from what we're used to in the tax world today. Um, So those are two really important things. And essentially, while under Pillar 2, all of the OECD member countries have agreed to this, what, I think we're like two years back now, or time is, time is ticking, we're at a place where now countries actually need to go implement the rules themselves. So that's really where we're at now. All right. Well, I, of course, I actually now I'm curious about Pillar 1, but let's talk about Pillar 2 first, <laughs> and then you guys can give me a quick Pillar 1 update. And for people who want to know more about Pillar 2 and sort of the mechanics and otherwise, we definitely have another episode that we'll uh, all include in the show notes. But in the meantime, I know there's a lot of current legislative developments sort of around the world. So Pat, what can you share with us? Sure, Heather. So I mean, t- as a starting point, and, and Jen alluded to this, uh, but t- just to make clear to the audience, the OECD is essentially a standard setting body. They have no authority. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what they produce is really just recommendations, effectively, for countries to choose or not to choose to implement in their national laws. And so the process that we're seeing right now is the process of countries going about um, putting putting Pillar 2 concepts into their national laws. Now, I will contrast here the OECD with the European Union, which, of course, the European Union, one of the very first formal actions with respect to Pillar 2 uh, was the European Union adopting a directive. 
unlike an OECD standard setting uh, policy, uh, a directive is binding on the member states of the European Union. And so when the directive was adopted, and we had a lot of questions last year throughout the course of 2022 as to whether or not the EU would get its act together and get a directive passed, which required a, the unanimous approval of all EU member states. Well, they did. They did that in December. And so now all EU member states are obligated to introduce Pillar 2 and enact it into their national laws during the course of 2023. It will start to take effect in 2024. That's the obligation. We are still in the early stages, frankly. So Germany, of course, the largest economy in the EU, but also one of the biggest proponents of Pillar 2, has introduced their version of the Pillar 2 legislation. Uh, and so they're, in effect, sort of one of the very early movers in this regard. But we we fully expect within Europe this is going to happen this year. Again, Germany is sort of out of the starting gates, but we fully expect other EU member states to follow. I would say in relatively short order. You know, we're already approaching May or sitting in May. And so where are we? Well, we've got a few months left. This has to enter international laws. The UK no longer a member of the EU, uh, has also uh, introduced their draft legislation uh, with expectations it will move forward this year. And we're seeing, you know, what I'll call sort of a hodgepodge of other countries with actions as well. So South Korea, given all us, all of us a little bit of uh, um, agita because they introduced their draft legislation last year, uh, approved by the South Korean legislature, um, but the effective dates purported to be accelerated relative to what the OECD has had generally determined. So um, Pillar 2 was generally supposed to take effect 2024 for the so-called IIR portion and 2025 for the UTPR portion, which is the much more controversial portion of Pillar 2. South Korea's legislation says 2024 for both portions, uh, both the IIR and the UTPR. Now, again, this is in a state where, and Jen and I have talked about this, uh, where you would say it's enacted, but there is further action on the part of the South Korean government in the form of a presidential decree that will provide further details around this. So again, a lot of confusion about this. There's been a lot of speculation that South Korea will get itself aligned with the rest of the world with 2024 and 2025. But it is actually one of the big open questions, in addition to seeing how other countries provide the details in their national laws. There is a big question, and what is South Korea going to do about this effective date point, which is a big deal, mm -hmm. a really big deal, actually. So so you, I know we said we weren't talking mechanics, but you did use two abbreviations there that I want to make sure the audience knows. So I think you said I, I, IRR and UTPR. Is that right? And what Close. do those close? What I, I, R. I wrote that down first. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> and then I convinced myself I was wrong. So I, I, R and UTPR, what do those stand yeah. for generally? So, sure. So the I, I, R is really the primary pillar two rule. And the way to think about the I, I, R is the top company in a multinational group of companies. So let's make it easy. Let's talk about a U.S. company, even though the U.S. is not going to introduce these rules into its national laws anytime soon. Um, the U.S. company, as the top co in a group, would say, we are introducing the IIR. What does that mean? It means that every foreign affiliate that sits underneath that U.S. top co has to be tested as to whether or not it has paid 15% tax in its local jurisdiction. Uh, so the French subsidiaries, the U.K. subsidiaries, the Bermuda subsidiaries, everybody gets tested. Have you paid sufficient tax in your jurisdiction? If not, the IIR parent company, in, in my simple example, the U.S., would say, well, you didn't pay enough tax in your local jurisdiction. You got to pay more, and you're going to pay it to the U.S. as the top co. Okay, that's the IIR. The UTPR, which is often referred to as a backstop rule, it is a much more controversial rule, as I mentioned. And what the UTPR essentially would say is, well, what if the, you're the U.S. and the U.S. doesn't introduce the IIR, mm -hmm. and now you've got a French subsidiary and a Bermuda subsidiary sitting underneath the, U, the U.S. Topco? Under the UTPR, the French subsidiary of the U.S. company would say, there is insufficient tax paid by my Bermuda affiliate. Not my Bermuda sub, but my Bermuda affiliate. Uh, and because there's insufficient tax paid in Bermuda, I, France, will impose additional tax in France 
because my brother or sister company is low taxed in their jurisdiction. Now, one of the things that makes it really, that's already pretty controversial, mm-hmm. it's quite novel. One of the things that makes it really controversial and particularly um, you know, interesting from the standpoint of the US, I mentioned the US is very unlikely to introduce an IIR anytime soon. The UTPR concept, again, go back to my simple example, doesn't just apply laterally on a brother-sister basis. It also would enable the French subsidiary, in my example, to look up to its U.S. parent and say, the U.S. parent hasn't paid 15% tax. And because the U.S. parent hasn't paid 15% tax, I, France, will impose additional tax because my parent company has not paid sufficient tax. That is a very controversial, politically controversial now in the United States, as we'll talk about, and very novel concept. So it's a perfect lead in to my next question, because I think what can be very confusing here is that we started or we've talked in other podcasts, at least by saying the U.S. actually does have a 15 percent minimum tax, which is the corporate alternative minimum tax. So what? It's the difference here. It sounds the same. It's not confusing <laughs> at all. No, not, not at all. Confusing at not, all. Not the exact same percentages or anything. So. Right, right. You, and you, not both minimums. Right. So. <laughs> well, you, you could almost say the U.S. has an addiction to minimum taxes because we, are now, we now have several of them. The very latest, which was just enacted last year in 2022, uh, the corporate alternative min ta- minimum tax, we call, we call it the CAMT, um, is, as you noted, Heather, it's a 15% minimum tax. Interestingly enough, going back to another similarity with Pillar 2 that Jen mentioned, uh, the CAMT is based on book income. So it starts with gap financial income, and it's at 15%. So you say, Jen talked about a 15% minimum tax based on book income. The CAMT is a 15% minimum tax on book income. They must be about the same. That's really where the comparisons between the two stops. Um, the CAMT, unlike Jen mentioned that, the, that Pillar 2 is done on a per-jurisdiction basis, the CAMT is not done on a per-jurisdiction basis. All jurisdictions, if you're, again, focus on being a U.S. multinational, if you're a U.S. multinational, the U.S. plus all foreign jurisdictions are essentially looked at together. There are some nuances to that, but essentially that's the right way to think about it. And very differently from Pillar 2, Pillar 2 would essentially look at things like the U.S. R&D credit or other forms of tax credits that reduce your tax liability and say, from a Pillar 2 perspective, those all are considered bad in the sense that they reduce your tax liability and therefore potentially expose you to additional tax. Congress, in enacting the CAMT, quite advertently, quite uh, openly, made exactly the opposite choice. They said, we want to protect all of these credits that we, the Congress, have enacted from essential from uh, from exposing companies to this minimum tax, and so they essentially said, "Hey, the U.S. R and D credit or other forms of credits, low income housing credits, production tax credits. I mean, we have an you know alphabet mm-hmm. soup of credits that we offer through the tax code. They're all going to be okay. They're not going to expose you to a minimum tax, as I mentioned, and Jen's going to talk about a little bit later. The OECD doesn't treat all credits the same, but a lot of the U.S. tax credits." are bad credits from the standpoint of Pillar 2. Congress made the opposite design choice. There are other differences as well, but the two things I would focus on are this treatment of credits that I just talked about. And the other thing, again, is the fact that Pillar 2 looks at each jurisdiction in isolation and the CAMT looks at everything together. So just to make sure I'm following on the latter point, then if I'm paying 30% in one jurisdiction and zero in another jurisdiction and I have the same amount of income in both, book income in both, under the uh, CAMT, as you said, then I'm set. I've paid 15%, but under the Pillar 2, it, 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 it wouldn't. It's exactly right, Heather. So, so and again, the, the, compli- the, the calculation under the CAMT is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, so I don't want to completely oversimplify. Yeah. But by and large, what you just said is correct. It is certainly the case to say that under Pillar 2, it does not matter. You can pay 40 or 50 or 80% tax in one jurisdiction. That does you no good when it comes to assessing whether or not you're sufficiently taxed in another jurisdiction. The CAMT generally asks a very simple question. Did you pay 15% tax on your income, on your book income? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you're done. Now, again, they make exceptions right, for credits right. and things like that. So, But it's a much simpler. I'm not going to suggest the CAMT is simple. Yes. It is a much simpler conceptual approach than Pillar 2. And Pat, the other thing there too is um, CAMT is refundable. 
So from a yes. big picture perspective, and when we think about it from a financial statement perspective, it's refundable. Any tax you pay under that, you're going, you it's can carry it forward it's indefinitely. And to the extent you're a regular taxpayer in the future, you can use that credit against it. That's very different. Than it, pillar it's two a great as well. point. It's a great point, Jen. And the timing mechanic could not be more different. So I should have mentioned that as well. That you know, pillar two. When when you talk about pillar two and timing differences, um, pillar two uses deferred tax concepts. The Congress does, did not use deferred tax concepts in the CAMT. They use this concept of you book a credit when you pay the CAMT, and as Jen mentioned, you carry that forward, and then in a future year, when your uh, regular tax liability is higher, you get to recover it. You basically get, you know, you can reduce your regular tax liability with the CAMT credit. So another key difference, probably three differences we should have highlighted, not just two, you know, the, the, the jurisdiction versus overall calculation, the treatment of credits, and this treatment of timing issues the credit concept that the CAMT uses versus deferred taxes in the Pillar 2 world. So obviously tax policy, U.S. tax policy maybe in particular, is incredibly complex. But when I think about your example, your UTPR, where you said that French subsidiary could look up and grab taxes because they weren't paid in the U.S., why? And but you also mentioned earlier that the U.S. is not going to introduce this anytime soon. Those seem conflicting. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's, it is a great question to ask. So uh, so the, the U.S., of course, we started off um, – well, let me take a step back. The U.S., as we have talked about previously, Heather, we were the original mm-hmm. adopter of a minimum tax, right? Our guilty regime, which we've talked about in prior podcasts, is a minimum tax regime. I mentioned we are addicted to minimum taxes. Guilty is a f- form of minimum tax. The KMT is another minimum tax. Uh, we have lots of minimum taxes, actually. Um, so we have both of those things. Under the Trump administration, the U.S. Treasury's approach to uh, Pillar 2 was essentially, you guys do what you, in the rest of the world, you do what you want with this minimum tax stuff. We've already got our system. Basically, just leave us alone. And that, that concept was referred to as the so-called guilty grandfather. And that was the position of the Trump administration. The Biden administration, when they came in in January 2021, said, no go. We think the U.S. needs to change its rules as well. We want to more closely align our rules with Pillar 2. We're going to move guilty to a per-jurisdiction tax. We're going to make some other changes to guilty that actually would have made guilty quite a bit, quite a bit tougher than Pillar 2. Fast forward, the U.S. did not make any of the legislative changes that we said we were going to make. And so now we're faced with a situation where the U.S. at the U.S. Treasury Department level has essentially endorsed a regime that exposes U.S. companies in the U.S., to additional tax imposed by other countries by virtue of the UTPR. It's a confusing state of affairs. Um, Obviously, now we have divided government post the 2022 midterm elections. Um, The Republicans control the House of Representatives, and their position with respect to Pillar 2 is, and I'm obviously going to summarize here, paraphrase, uh, we're not doing this. uh, And we're going to essentially say to other countries, And you're going to leave us alone. You are not going to impose these taxes on U.S. companies in the U.S. The response from other countries has been, actually, we've all agreed to this. And so the intention is to move forward. So the U.S. is effectively on a sort of collision course with other countries with respect to Pillar 2. This could really get quite messy. And for companies, what that means is there's a really significant exposure to what what we in the tax world call double taxation. Multiple countries asserting the right to tax the same income with not a coordinated tax credit mechanism to avoid double taxation. It is a real concern. It is something that a lot of companies are very worried about. From a company perspective, Pat, I think fair to say just a massive amount of uncertainty. Like when you're sitting here as a company trying to make decisions about buying and selling Mm -hmm. simple things, where I'm investing, how I'm investing, which jurisdictions, you look at everything you just walked through, that collision course, you know, it's not only this collision, but it's like a level of uncertainty that makes your actual decisions Right. It's, and that's a great point, Jen. And I know from, from my history, you know, I spent many years working inside of a company. Companies, you know, they really try very hard to plan over a multi-year cycle. You try and look out several years as you're trying to forecast your income, your ETR, 
Um, you know, frankly, you look at that on in terms of a marginal investment you're looking to make. How do I think this will, you know, what do I think the return on this investment will be? Jen's point about the uncertainty associated with all of this, where will the U.S. be? How much am I likely facing into double taxation? If I'm thinking about making an investment in the U.S., it's going to generate significant tax credits, these general business credits that we talked about. Am I going to actually get the benefit of those credits? Or am I going to end up essentially writing a check, in our example, Heather, am I going to end up writing a check to France because I did too much foreign, uh, too much tax credit investment in the United States? It's it's a really, really challenging situation for companies from an FP&A perspective, and just frankly, more generally. So let me just reconfirm. I, you said this IIR is 2024 is what's yes. been agreed. And then this UTPR is 2025. So in theory, it could get straightened out. But if we think about the fact the election is between now and then seems highly unlikely. Yeah, I think things are going to get, I think the tension's going to get ratcheted up before what, what I hope will happen, but I certainly have no you know, assurance whatsoever of this. I hope that there will ultimately be some form of a rapprochement or a resolution of these things. But I mean, I'm just guessing. I don't know that. And I I don't think there is nothing that you see right now that suggests we're headed towards resolution. It suggests we're we're headed towards a ratcheting up of tensions uh, with hopefully, you know, at some point saner heads prevail and we come to some sort of an accommodation between the U.S. and other countries, which may require movement on both sides. I just don't mm-hmm. know. And then are there other countries, I'll say large economies, that are also sort of taking the U.S. like stay away position or is the U.S. kind of an island? Well, I, I don't, I'm not aware of other countries who are not moving forward who have been as vocal about it. So, for example, I'll pick two very, very large developing countries, India and Mm -hmm. China. China has been very, very circumspect, very quiet about what they have said. Now, they have signed on in the sense at a political level, just like the United States uh, signed on. Uh, But in terms of actual legislation moving forward, really very little from from China. And I I say very little, basically nothing. Um, And India is another country where they essentially have looked at this and said, you mentioned pillar one before, hey, we really like this two pillar thing, like this pillar one's really important, but not a lot of indication that they're moving forward on pillar two. But no one has expressed the same level of, um, I'll say, appetite for confrontation mm-hmm. that the the Republicans in the House have, have expressed with respect to pillar two as applied within the home country. And when you talk about planning, you guys both mentioned this, is as you're meeting with companies, is this like sort of the top of mind headline issue from a tax VP point of view, or are there plenty of other issues we're going to get into? I, 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 so I'm going to slightly oversimplify, Heather. I would say between pillar two and the CAM two, yeah. the U.S. minimum tax, that's probably about ninety percent of my day on you know literally day in and day out, and a little bit more of that is pillar two. So it's probably a you know sixty forty between those two. Uh, between Pillar 2 and CAMT. But yeah, I mean, this is everybody is is focused on Pillar 2 on a daily basis. Wow. So. All right. Well, it's almost hard to go to accounting after we talk about that's a, such a major business issue. However, you need to reflect business issues in your financial statements. So big picture, Jen, what are the FASB and the ISB doing from an accounting perspective to deal with this new minimum tax? Yeah, I mean, that's probably the only bit of good news here. I, um, while getting at it in two very different ways, uh, the short answer is that there will not be deferred tax accounting at all of these enactment dates. And that obviously was a big, big question as we watched South Korea go through its actions in December. But let me start with the FASB. So the FASB um, has, on a public board meeting, announced in response to a technical inquiry that they believe that Pillar 2 is an alternative minimum tax as specifically provided for in the income tax accounting standard. So what that basically means is that there's no deferred tax accounting. Um, So at the date of enactment, there wouldn't be anything more than disclosure and that's not to minimize disclosure. Mm -hmm. Companies should clearly be thinking about that as we continue through 2023 and see all of the actions. But what it means is that you essentially are going to account for Pillar 2, that top-up tax that we mentioned, in the period in which um, you incur it. And to be clear, when I say in the period, it's just going to be a part, for example, in 2024, it would just be a part of somebody's annual effective tax rate. I don't literally mean like discrete in an accounting sense. I've had that question a few times. 
So, so that's where you'll be from a U.S. GAAP perspective. The ISB issued an exposure draft. So they had talked about this in, I guess, November of last year. And they issued an exposure draft it, the, in uh, January. The comment letter period ended in March. And we're actually expecting to see the final standard in the second half of May. So they just met on April 11th, um, at they being the ISB, and concluded they will move forward with the final standard. This standard basically will provide for a um, mandatory, but uh, temporary, but mandatory exception from deferred tax accounting. Now, what does that mean? I think it's important to note what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the ISB has concluded that deferred taxes are actually necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, When you look at the basis of conclusion, what they've said is there's a lot to be answered and there's a lot of information that's not yet available, not the least of which you have this staggered effective date between IIR and UTPR Mm and sort of a mixed bag as to how that's all going to all going to look. And, you know, we haven't even gotten into qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes, which is a whole other animal, right? But the point is the ISB recognized that there was a lot of lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. And so they haven't concluded that it's necessary. What they've said is this is a temporary mandatory exception from doing deferred accounting. So they're taking away the uncertainty. Um, So it does come with some disclosure, but um, from the exposure draft to the April 11th meeting, the ISB has actually said they're going to change the the final standard. And I think the big ones that companies are paying attention to, they've removed the original requirement to do interim disclosures in 2023. So I think that's a big win for companies as they're trying to figure out what they're going um, to do here. But the other one that they're doing is they had a pretty lengthy disclosures that dealt with when a um, you had an enactment but not yet effective details that you needed to provide. And a lot of them focused on your effective tax rate under IAS 12, so the income tax accounting standard um, for IFRS. Uh, what they actually are going to replace that with is a much more qualitative discussion that deals with where a company is. If there is a known or knowable estimate, companies should expect to apply it, but they can also do it in a range. And when I say it, I mean a known or knowable estimate of your pillar to that top up tax. So we will see in the final standard some adjustments to the exposure draft, but I think all moving in a very positive direction. And at the end of the day, very different path, but getting to the same answer is there will be no deferred accounting at the date of enactment. So I think that's good. Um, You know, I think when you layer in the uncertainties Mm -hmm. just around the law and the integration of every single jurisdiction implementing these a little bit differently, it really does make sense. This is going to be a tax in the period. So, but to that point, if I take a step back and I think about Pat's point that, you know, this is what's top of mind, well, this and the the um, CAMT are sort of top of mind from a tax perspective. So then if it's not accounting, and I know, Jen, you're often talking to people about accounting, but what advice you're giving to people now? Because with this amount of uncertainty, you can't do planning. You, I mean, there's so many things you can't do. So what can you do? Well, maybe I'll, I'll start. I'm guessing Pat has some thoughts on this as well. You know, really what we're seeing companies doing right now is modeling because right now what you need to do is figure out, do I have the data? Do I have the mm. systems? Do I understand? Do I have all of the stakeholders in a company? Keep in mind what we talked about. This is based on financial statement income or loss. So anybody who talks to me very much knows I'm always talking about the integration of tax and accounting and put it together along with the business. Well, if you weren't convinced before, Pillar 2 would be the Mm -hmm. time because you really do need to bring all of that together, the business, accounting professionals, and tax professionals, because without one of those legs, you will get this wrong. So I think really what we're seeing now and what we're encouraging companies to do is do the modeling, figure out where your gaps are, little gaps, right? So figure out your little Gs, like what what do I need in the data, but I don't have available? Mm -hmm. How am I going to produce this? Because keep in mind, effective in 2024, you won't be filing a tax return for how long after right. that? It depends on the jurisdiction you're in, right? But you're going to actually need to reflect this in your financial statements beginning with the first day of your year, right? So it's going to be baked into your effective tax rate. It's going to impact your entire tax provision. So we're, we're just not, you know, we're right on the horizon of May 
That's not so very no. long away. So, so from my perspective, that's what I've, you know, we've been talking a lot about with companies and certainly in meetings that I'm in. And, you know, Pat, again, I'm sure you have some thoughts. I, a couple, uh, I agree with everything Jen said. I think the um, place I would start is, you know, from the conversations, and I've had a lot of conversations with, with companies, um, and Jen, I think you'd agree with this, very few, maybe to as few as none, um, would do a, if you're a U.S. gap filer here, would do a U.S. gap subconsolidation at a foreign at each foreign jurisdiction level, right? Sure. Companies roll up their financials in lots of different ways. They might do it regionally. They'll do it oftentimes by business line. Um, but the idea that you would have sort of a, a U.S. gap um, level subconsolidation in each jurisdiction around the world, if you're a U.S. gap father, or an IFRS subconsolidation, if you're an IFRS, companies just don't keep their books that way, right? And so Jen's point is, look. If you're the tax director of one of these companies, you, you know you have to be talking to the controllers. You have to be talking to the other people in the finance function, in some cases even outside of the finance function, because some of the data that's required under Pillar 2 about employees and location of employees and things like that, I won't you know, torture people with all the details on this, but there is a lot that is required that is outside of the tax department's domain. Um, uh, most of that is in the finance department uh, of, of, of companies. But so there's a great deal of information that's required that will require tax people to go have conversations, which I'm sure a lot of these conversations are already happening. I know they are. And of course, the reaction from controllers and others is always some version of, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Like, this doesn't make any sense. What? How can this possibly be? Uh, who agreed to this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so that there's a huge amount of work that has to happen. And as Jen mentioned, time is very short. It is really coming upon us very, very quickly. So I think, you know, while, while uh, I wouldn't say that panic has set in, a real sense of urgency has set in uh, on the part of virtually every company that I talk to that this is not something that sits anywhere in systems today. It's got to be created. There is a little bit of a silver lining here I want to point out to people or a little bit of a bright spot. One of the things that the OECD did was provide some what we call transitional safe harbors that provide for, in a lot of cases, a radically simplified calculation for the first couple of years. Now, they're not perfect. They're not a panacea. If you qualify for these safe harbors, though, and and qualifying for those safe harbors essentially is you take an existing, what we call a country-by-country return uh, that the OECD has already had in place that companies have already been filing for a couple of years. It is a very simple calculation relative to Pillar 2. Relative to Pillar 2, very simple. If you qualify for a minimum, having paid a minimum amount of tax under that computation, you can essentially say, I'm done with this, this particular jurisdiction. The reason I say it's not a panacea is you either qualify or don't qualify for the safe harbor. If you don't qualify for the safe harbor in a jurisdiction, you're doing the full-blown Pillar 2 calculations. And I haven't spoken to any company who says, I qualify for the safe harbors in every jurisdiction. So you're still going to have a meaningful number of jurisdictions where you've got to do the full-blown computations. To Jen's point, all that's got to be reflected in your financials starting next year. So it is coming and coming fast. There is, again, the OECD tried to provide a little bit of breathing room, and I think it's helpful, but again, far from a panacea. One, Pat, you you can correct me if I'm wrong, but those country-by-country reports, those aren't something that anybody's audited to date or looked at, right? Those are reports that companies are filing with the government, not publicly available, at least not yet. Um, So, you know, there's there's a lot to be said there. Yes, a huge amount of uncertainty around that as well. Good point, Jen. <laughs> so, but I guess what you guys are both seeing is one way to deal with the broader uncertainty is to at least make sure you have all the information because then once there's more clarity, then at least you'll be able to apply it. But I mean, you're describing an incredible amount of work that needs yes. to be done. Yes. And I guess, Jen, the other thing that kind of occurred to me as you guys were talking, this also in some ways puts pressure on IFRS US GAP differences, because if you're a US GAP reporter versus an IFRS reporter, in some cases, you may have different book income, in which case means identical companies are paying different tax. I'm not saying FASB and ISB are dealing with that now, but it seems like in the long run, that may also have some impact from a reporting perspective. Well, there's no question it will have an impact from a reporting perspective, and particularly in those industries where you're sort of split on the big companies, where you're sort of almost completely split between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. And there's no question that those differences, that's something we've talked about right from the beginning. You know, it's important to realize these are your GAAP 
whatever gap it is, yes. whether it's IFRS or US GAAP, but it's your GAAP financial statements. It's not like your local statutory account. So intercompanies are respected and honored in this model. So, you know, there's there's a lot there um, that, that, you know, ultimately I've heard some say the, the pain of it almost maybe, I don't know, Pat, if you have a perspective on this, but you know, some companies might get to a place where the actual top up tax isn't, um, you know, necessarily substantial. It still might not be helpful, but, but the compliance exercise, even if, right. I mean, is that a fair statement? Oh, 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 I mean, I have talked to a number of companies who say they expect the actual tax impact of pillar two, not likely to be material to them. Uh, but the compliance burden is very significant. And again, it's, it's, person hours associated with getting ready for this. It's also a huge amount of potential mm-hmm. cost and systems and things like that. So, I mean, it is at least as big of an issue as the actual change to your tax liability for many companies. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, quickly, I know we have a few other topics, but I do want to at least ask about Pillar 1, at, just to get a brief update. So, Pat, I don't know if there's something you can share. Is it moving or is it Stuck. Stuck. Uh, (laughs) So what Pillar 1 is, just to remind folks, and I will do this very quickly, uh, Pillar 1, which really was the original impetus behind this overall project, uh, is essentially an initiative to say, to the extent companies are, I'll put this in quotation marks, doing business in a jurisdiction or selling to customers, products or services to customers in a jurisdiction. But under traditional tax concepts, they don't have a significant presence in that jurisdiction. They may have no presence in that jurisdiction. So you think about this as largely the digital economy, although it's not limited to the digital economy, uh, but companies who essentially have profits in a jurisdiction without presence in the jurisdiction. Uh, Then the jurisdictions, the so-called market jurisdictions, looked at that and said, this is inappropriate. We, We need to come up with a mechanism to get some of the taxing jurisdiction shifted over to our to us as the market jurisdiction. We are the market. We have some right to tax the value that's being extracted here. Uh, and Pillar 1 is intended to provide that. Now, unlike Pillar 2, Pillar 1, from the very beginning, it was clear that Pillar 1 had to move forward through a treaty, a multilateral treaty that has to be signed on and ratified by jurisdictions to take effect. Um, that is very unlikely to happen. Uh, in particular, one of the things that was agreed about a year ago uh, was that in order, because so much of this involves the United States, so much of the big companies uh, who are essentially the target of Pillar 1 uh, are U.S. companies, uh, the OECD agreed that this couldn't really take effect for any country unless it was agreed by the United States. Um, Treaties don't move very quickly in the United States. Uh, Tax treaties move even slower. Multilateral tax treaties don't happen at all. Uh, And so the idea that you're going to get 67 U.S. senators to sign on to a multilateral tax treaty from the OECD is simply not going to happen anytime soon. So Pillar 1 is stuck. All right. Well, I I have many follow-up questions, but we have other topics. So let me go back to something else you mentioned, which you, when we were talking about Pillar 2, one of the things you mentioned is that one of the differences with the U.S. minimum tax, the CAMT, is that all the credits and otherwise for the CAMT, you get to take those into account. Obviously, one of the biggest places we have credits is from the Inflation Reduction Act. And one of the things that I had asked Jen about previously about that was the fact that some of those credits are transferable and some are not. And why is that? And she said, Pat, that you would be able to share all of your knowledge on this topic. Yeah, this is a head scratcher. I'm just going to say it. Um, So... um, and and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more. You can think about credits, broadly speaking, in the United States in three buckets. Um, there are what I will call regular credits. And these are essentially, so think about like the US R&D credit. Um, to the extent you have sufficient tax liability, you reduce your tax liability by the amount of this credit. If you don't have sufficient tax liability, mm-hmm. you're done. You know, essentially now you can carry it forward and use it in a future year when you have tax liability, but you can't do anything else with it. That's the sort of, you know, I'll call it kind of the baseline garden variety credit. The Inflation Reduction Act introduced uh, a concept of a transferable credit. Uh, this is, I think, a brand new animal in the United States tax system. We didn't have this previous to the Inflation Reduction Act, which which was enacted last year. Um, and essentially what the concept of a transferable credit is, you undertake an activity that entitles you to the credit. 
but you have insufficient tax liability to monetize the credit currently. Uh, and so you say, well, I could wait until next year, uh, carry the credit forward and try and use it next year, or could sell it to Jen. <laughs> Jen has sufficient liability to utilize the credit this year. Now, Jen is not going to pay me 100 cents on the dollar for the credit because otherwise there's nothing in it for her. Maybe she pays me 90 cents. Maybe she pays me 85. Maybe she pays me 98. I don't, but the market will figure that out. Um, but I will transfer the credit to her. I will get cash. She will get the credit, which she will then utilize, presumably on a current basis, to reduce her tax liability. Uh, that's the concept of a transferable credit. So that's sort of second bucket. The third bucket, sometimes we call it refundable. The, the, the Internal Revenue you, Internal Revenue Code uses the concept of direct pay. And essentially what that says is if you have insufficient liability against which to currently claim the credit, you can just tell the government and they will send you a check. Uh, so, you know, a refundable credit effectively. Again, we call it direct pay in the U.S. Internal Revenue Code. So, look, I think direct pay or refundable credits have clearly been disfavored in the United States historically. I'm speculating here, Heather, but I think some of that is, you know, concerns about potential mm -hmm. fraudulent activity. You know, you can you send the government a notification and they send you a check. Um, you can understand why you might want kind of more belt and suspenders around that. It also has some clear impact on, you know, who is eligible to claim the, claim the credit. So, for example, take like the R&D credit, which is not a refundable credit, not a direct pay credit. Um you know, if I have a great idea to start up a business in my garage, and at least I think it's a great idea, uh, and I spend a lot of money doing research and it never amounts to anything, um, I'm out of pocket. Um, if I'm eligible for a refundable R&D credit from the government, I've got a partner, the government. And if my idea is a bad one, the government's out of pocket too. Um, so you might... We could argue as a policy matter whether it's a better idea for the government to actually say, no, actually, I want to fund Pat's garage uh, fantasy experiment that maybe turns into a great thing. Um, we don't, you know, that's that's a, obviously a policy discussion people could have, uh, but we don't have that mechanism, and we historically haven't had it for most of our credits. Clearly, in the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress wanted to do something a bit different. They wanted to introduce a mechanism to make it mm -hmm. easier to monetize, particularly these green energy credits. They wanted to change the game. They made some of these credits direct pay, but for the most part, they did not. They said, we're going to introduce this novel mechanism of transferability. So that becomes the mechanism. Before the Inflation Reduction Act, if we were talking about credits and taxpayers had insufficient ability to monetize them... There was a structure that had been developed by the market, we call it tax equity, for some of these credits. Primarily, you would see it in low-income housing credits or um, production tax credits in the wind energy or investment tax credits in the solar space. And the nature of these tax equity structures was, again, take use personalize it to me, I'm a developer of a low-income housing project or a wind farm or something like that. I don't have sufficient tax liability to utilize the credits. Jen is a large bank or a large financial institution that has uh, both sophistication to understand the level of the, you know, the nature of these investments and also has sufficient tax liability. Jen would come in and co-invest with me in a tax equity structure, in a structure with, that would essentially allocate all of the credits to her. But I, and what would I get out of this deal? I would get financing, which I need. And to the extent there would be a cash return ultimately from my investment, I would get most of the cash. She would get most of the tax credits. That's really the only mechanism we had. So the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, really mm -hmm. did change the game by introducing the concept of a transferable credit. But it's brand new. And are you seeing market developments yet in terms of the pricing? Too soon to say, I was in, Jen, you may have a comment on this, but too soon to say in terms of clearly where pricing will land, a mm -hmm. lot of discussion about where pricing will land. Because, of course, I have heard some companies say, if I don't like the pricing, I might look to tax equity as an alternative to this. So, you know, a lot now, again, tax equity is not nearly as flexible as a transferable credit uh, concept. So, I mean, there are real reasons to prefer transferable credits, but it ultimately comes down to what the market will decide. Yeah, when Pat talks about before his day is, you know, what was it, 90% of your day is pillar two and KMT, mine's like 90% 
uh, pillar two and tax credits. <laughs> How do you account for them? And and so like we're seeing a lot of discussion about what contracts might look like and therefore right. what would I need to do with that from an accounting perspective. Right. But doesn't seem to be the market yet. Mm-hmm. It's it's all of the discussion leading into that. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, definitely more to come. And very interesting. I can see we could have had a whole podcast just on this topic. But one of the things that I do want to go back, because we did make this point when we we're talking about Pillar 2, that they're treated differently in Pillar 2. So how are they treated? Yeah. I mean, it, it ties in very perfectly with what we just, with what Pat just teed up. So maybe there's two areas to think about in Pillar 2, and I'll maybe kick it off. Um, At a super big picture, Pat just talked about refundable and non-refundable credits. And so from an accounting perspective, which again, keep in mind, let's go back, Pillar 2 triggers off your financial reporting, right? So that's why you come full circle. Um, From an accounting perspective, when you have a refundable credit, meaning it has no tie in to whether you have an income tax liability or not, whether you you have one, whether you have to pay one, it doesn't matter. You can monetize the credit just by going to the government and asking for the refund. Um, When you have a credit like that, that will be accounted for outside of the income tax line. When you have a credit that is only available essentially through having a tax liability, that is going to get accounted for on the tax line. So pillar two basically follows that. So both refundable and non-refundable credits are going to, they absolutely are both going to have an impact on your ETR, but a credit that is non-refundable, just the way that it is set up, is likely to have a much deeper impact on your ETR because it's a direct reduction, as Pat said before, um, in your covered taxes. So when you think about that numerator, it's reducing directly. It's a credit, it's dollar for dollar. You know, so there's a lot there, um, and that's going to likely have a deeper impact on your ETR. So as a result, it can immediately go to, as, as Pat was alluding to before, you know, you get these credits, they're given to you for a policy reason, they're meant to incent behaviors, and now essentially they will drive you right into having a tax um, through the top-up tax mechanism. There's also a lot um, of discussion around these equity investments that Pat talked about, and um, the model rules attempted to deal with some of those structures, um, you know, debatable how far we really got. And there's been some additional guidance, but Pat, I'll let you go from there because I know that's something you've been answering a lot of questions on. I know you and I have talked a lot about it, but let me let you weigh in there. Yeah. So we talked, Heather, about tax equity. Uh, and it's uh, when when the model rules from uh, the OECD Pillar 2 model rules were released, there was there was just a distinction between refundable credits and all other credits. And that was it. And as Jen mentioned, um, non-refundable credits, the all other credits category, just reduce your ETR essentially dollar for dollar. Um, that gave rise to a what I will call a political problem uh, in the United States because you know when you think about some of these credits, they are credits that are not just popular on the Republican side, but also in some cases actually as mm-hmm. popular or more popular on the Democratic side. And so in particular, things like low-income housing credits, uh, but also production tax credits for wind energy are two re- really prominent examples where tax equity was a mm-hmm. big driver uh, of the way these things were structured. And again, from a political perspective, it was awkward, to put it mildly, uh, for the Biden administration to be off negotiating, championing a deal that was apparently going to put some of these credits at risk because the credit claimants, and again, for the most part, we're talking here about pretty large size companies, mostly large financial institutions, were back channel talking to people in the Biden Treasury Department and saying, this is actually a problem. This is going to give rise to a pillar two liability for us, and that will significantly diminish our appetite for making these investments. So that message was sent, essentially delivered to the Biden administration, to the Treasury Department, received. Uh, The problem is the Pillar 2 rules don't make any provision for this. There was some, uh, early on, there was people pointing to some language in the Pillar 2 rules that talked about equity method investments generally. Well, can I I grab onto that language and say that if it's an equity method investment, I can just exclude the credits entirely from the computation of Pillar 2? 
Um, that always seemed a little heroic to me that they would be able to kind of bring that home. But that was sort of where the conversation started. Ultimately, what happened in the OECD's most recently released administrative guidance, this is now only a couple of months old, by the way. So this, this is an issue that was really lingering throughout all of last year and really bothering companies, but also bothering the Treasury Department. What do we do with these tax equity structures, low-income housing credits, production tax credits? So the OECD essentially agreed to a brand new concept. Um, and essentially, at a very high level, what it provides is to the extent you are an investor in a tax equity structure uh, and you are claiming essentially a return on an investment that is very largely in the form of tax benefits, tax credits, accelerated depreciation, but call it tax credit just to make it simple. So your economic return is really in the form of tax credits. Uh, you're an equity method investor in that, in that structure. You can essentially say most of the tax credits that flow back to me, and I'll clarify what I mean by most, most of the tax credits that flow back to me, I can ignore for pillar two purposes. Now, this is an entirely made up result. I want to be clear on that. They didn't sort of point to the model rules and say, well, here's the relevant language that permits this interpretation. They essentially said, we're going to make up a new, we're going to make new law uh, and apply it to in the pillar two context. And it's, the, the, the realization was, look, if you're a bank, you invest $100 in one of these things, you're going to get back $120 in tax credits. It doesn't make sense, normatively, they would say, to have a $120 ETR reduction. So where they landed was to say, if you make the investment, you meet the qualifying conditions, the first $100 you get back, we're going to ignore that. The return of your invested capital will be ignored, if it comes in the form of tax credits, will be ignored for pillar two purposes. But going back to my example, you get to your $101, that is going to be a reduction in your ETR. Now, from the standpoint of the banks, the financial institutions, and, and other big investors in this, that basically gets them close enough. They look at that and they say, okay, I invest $100, i am going to get $120 in tax credits. If $120 was going to be all a reduction of my ETR, that's a disaster. If it's only the 20 I might have an issue, but I think I can live with that. And that's where we sit right now with respect to this, uh, this concept, so-called qualified flow-through tax benefits that was, again, introduced brand new concept just a couple of months ago by the OECD. And, and I will just say, I, there's a lot of language in there, Heather, that you probably, you could at least um, connect to, or it might sound a lot like when we talk about things like equity method accounting, proportional amortization, the EITF project that was just finalized in a new standard that expanded potential potentially, well, I mean, depending if you qualify um, for these equity investments on proportional amortization. So once again, it's like dancing around all of this language and other issues that we have in financial accounting. And how does that apply here? Could be pretty interesting if you're dealing with proportional amortization, trying to sort that out, and then you've got a pillar two model and, you know, that's got a different threshold. So again, that's probably like a whole separate web podcast, but I would just say like, as you listen to that, you can see some of these connections with financial accounting, where when you try to build a base in tax off of financial accounting, it's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I will also add, I think it's a great point, Jen. The one other thing I will add, because the audience might very well be thinking to themselves, okay, so we've got tax equity. Uh, Jen talked about regular credits and refundable credits. What has the OECD said about these transferable credits? And the answer is exactly nothing. Oh, well, that was my next question for you. <laughs> so we don't know. So I was trying to figure out if there was like a play here, whether it's advantage to these different credits or this tax structure, but you're we, saying we, we don't know. They, they have said nothing at all. Now, I think what, th there's a lot of concern that that gives rise to a negative inference that a transferable credit is just a bad credit uh, because, and by bad, I mean, it's just a normal credit. It's clearly not refundable, uh, but we don't know. We just don't know. There's no guidance on it whatsoever from the OECD. The question has been posed to folks in the Treasury Department. What is the answer? We just enacted these things in the U.S. Not a lot of other countries, if any, have this concept mm -hmm. of transferable. What's the answer? And the answer, I will paraphrase, summarize the answer is we but don't what's know. what's interesting about that is that from an accounting perspective on transferable credits, right? So also through a technical inquiry with the FASB, one possible accounting answer would be to account for a transferable credit above the line. And I think many companies have are going down that path. I think it remains to be seen for the reasons we talked about earlier. But the FASB had said that they believed that the most appropriate accounting was to account for it on the tax line. And then any gain or loss, which, as you mentioned before, Pat, it would be expected to be a loss because otherwise, why am I going to buy that credit? 
um, if there's no margin. So that would also be reflected on the tax line. But they acknowledge that um, that gap was not clear. And when you think about the accounting model, just to take a different lens, when you think about, think about the accounting model and refundable credits, you apply pre-tax accounting because you're able to monetize the credit other than through the tax mm-hmm. line. And part of that analysis, some of those companies back when the credits first became refundable, they had had those credits before utilities. I know that's a, a big one, right? Yeah. So they had already it's had those huge credits. Thing. They just yeah. accounted for them on tax line. They were very profitable. They were monetizing the credits and they were going to continue to do so even when these credits back in 08, 09 became refundable. Um, the accounting model said because you can monetize those without regard to taxable income, so there's another way to monetize them, they were more akin to a government grant or government government subsidy. When you think about a transferable credit, there is an element of that. I can monetize this mm-hmm. credit without any taxable income because I can actually just sell them. And so it brings in everything you just said. So when you think about from the OECD's lens, if you're basing it on financial accounting, some companies could have them above the line. Some companies could have them below below the line. So on the tax line, Heather, you asked before about differences between US GAAP and IFRS, but think about this, you know, just a transferable credit, everybody's got one and then they all treat it differently. That's not even getting to what will the IFRS treatment of those credits be? Because that again could be different. As a follow-up to that then, and it kind of fits in with everything here, it seems like from a company point of view, For me listening, it's modeling data, making sure you have all the information and then considering all these alternatives. However, that's me after listening to you guys for about 45 minutes. So definitely curious what advice you both have or sort of final thoughts you both have. And so Jen, I'll go to you first. I think the thing that comes to mind is um, a question of skill set and how an organization, how tax department, how finance department has organized itself. You know, for years we've talked about, do you have the right skills in the right places to do all that's being asked of a tax department? Mm -hmm. And I think everything we've talked about here today brings that back, right? We used to talk about it in the context of state aid. So um, do you have the right um, lens for competition law? Um, You know, you often talk about, you know, your planning skills, Mm -hmm. your compliance skills. These skills sometimes can, um, you know, be in an individual, but oftentimes it's different people have different attributes they bring to the table. So now you're looking at this and you're saying, I need somebody that can connect the dots. Like I need somebody that understands the tax accounting, but it's not enough to just understand tax accounting. You have to understand accounting accounting. You got to understand the pre-tax accounting, but at the same time for all of the things, even as we just talked about the credits, you have to be able to interact and work with the business people to be able to connect all of that. So I think there is just a, um, for me, I walk away from every conversation about this, just thinking about what are the skills necessary in a tax department today or in a finance organization today to be able to deal with all Mm -hmm. of these priorities and frankly, competing priorities in many cases. Time hasn't actually increased. There are still only 24 hours in any given day. So, (laughs) you know. Well, and real dollars here too that you're talking about. I think sometimes other accounting, not to to say it's not very important, but here, just the conversation we're just having, it can make a real difference in in how much a company realizes. So Pat, how about from your perspective? Well, I I agree with everything that Jen said. And, you know, the analogy that I keep coming back to is I, as I, even hearing our conversation, you know, you you sometimes see these um, uh, pictures of spectators watching a tennis match. And their eyes go back Mm -hmm. and forth and back and forth as the ball goes back and forth over the net. Um, The problem with the current situation, if you're the tax director inside of a company, or frankly, even some of the non-tax folks preparing for this is, you don't have to look in two directions. You have to look in so many different directions at once because, you know, we talked about early on about countries implementing this and various stages of implementing. And and Jen has alluded a couple of times to an important point, which is countries are not implementing it exactly the mm-hmm. same way. And so you, it's not going to be one size fits all across countries. In addition, one of the things I mentioned earlier is the OECD has released interpretive guidance, they have already said they're going to release more interpretive guidance. So they're intending absolutely to provide more substantive rules that will basically influence and inform the way these rules actually take final shape. Uh, 
again, that's at the OECD level. You've also got the national country level. So if you are sitting within a company trying to figure out how do I prepare myself for this, it's not a question of what do I focus on one thing or even two things. There are multiple things across multiple jurisdictions, across multiple levels. Obviously, one of the things very of great interest to this audience is, and how will the accounting mm-hmm. profession kind of take on board these concepts? Jen talked about a lot of the questions that have fortunately been answered around things like deferred accounting for pillar two, but there's a lot more we still don't know the answer to uh, as, you know, as, as the rules overall take shape. So you have to look at a lot of different, a lot of different directions at once, unfortunately, and I don't think there's a way around that. All right. Well, it definitely sounds like I should be uh, scheduling our next podcast now because we have plenty (laughs) more to talk about, but both it's such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. us. That's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.